Hello, welcome everyone. It's so nice to see everyone here today. Thank you so much for joining us. If you are in a place where you are able to, please turn on your video. This is a very, very small class and it's going to be highly interactive. And so we would love to see your face and make this feel as much like an in-person classroom experience as possible. We completely yeah. understand some of you can't. Some of you are probably in a car or in a in a place where bandwidth is low, and that's okay. So if you're not able to, that's okay. But if you are able to, please join us live. Um, and I am so happy and pleased and honored that I get to join you for today's first session. My name is Allison Weiss, and I'm the Associate Director of Corporate and Executive Education at the Brown School of Professional Studies. The mission of the Brown School of Professional Studies is to equip you with the, the tools, the resources, and the network that you need to change the way the world works for good. And we feel so passionately about this because we spend over 50% of our lives at work. And there are so many studies that show that leaders like you have a disproportionate impact on the productivity and the well-being of our workforce. And so these also show that most leaders don't feel like we have the support structures that we need to be able to implement that in a really thoughtful way and inclusive way. So we are so glad that you've chosen to step up to the plate and to learn new skill sets that will help you stay very in demand in your career and help you make sure your team, your product, your organization stays in demand for the time to come. We are experiencing an unprecedented level of disruption. And the purpose of this Innovate to Elevate program, which we are so excited to kick off with you today, is to give you the tangible strategies to future-proof yourself, your career, and your organization. And we truly could not have a better person teaching this. And it's my great joy to introduce you to your faculty lead, Mike Grandinetti. Mike Grandinetti is a, an incredible faculty lead because he has a wealth of experience, both teaching and in industry. And so that means that he is going to be able to teach this course in an incredibly effective way. He has appointments at MIT, Harvard, UC Berkeley. He is constantly getting rave reviews that feel like he surely must have gotten paid. He must he surely must have paid someone to write them, but he didn't, saying <laughs> that his courses have changed their lives and are some of the most relevant courses people have ever taken. And in addition, he has deep wealth of experience in industry. So he's always teaching with an eye to application and, and integration, making sure it's useful to you right now. He's a former McKinsey consultant, and he was the chief operating officer for over eight startups. So we can't think of, I couldn't think of anyone better than you, Mike, to teach us and lead us through our innovation journey. Thank you for um, choosing to spend time here. We know that you could be in a lot of other places. And thank you to this group for also choosing to spend your time with us. We know you're very busy and we are honored that you've chosen us as a partner to help you upskill. So with that, I will turn things over to you, Mike. Allison, you are too kind and I am blushing um, as I as I receive that beautiful, warm introduction. Thank you so much. And it's a real pleasure to have a chance to have you in this classroom, right? And I very much want this to be a learning community I'm not here to lecture to you. I'm here to you know, facilitate a discussion with you. Very much want you to feel incredibly safe and comfortable sharing your own wealth of experiences, sharing your perspectives, asking questions, right? No question is a bad question. It is a small cohort. There are only 11 of you in this cohort. And so it really does give us an opportunity to get into the core issues that are important to you, both on an individual and an organizational basis. So I just want to, you know, have that opportunity to make everyone feel very welcome. And because we are such a small group, I think it would be only appropriate to ask each of you just to spend a minute, just, you know, your name, the organization you're with, and, and you know, your role within that organization. And perhaps just one thing that you're hoping to take away from our course. And Eric, because you um, are the first guy in my gallery, I'm going to give you the honor of uh, getting us started, okay? Now, you're not muted, but your microphone is not on. So you may either have to turn on your microphone. Got it. I was there muted. You know. Sorry okay. about that, Mike. Yeah. Uh, my name is Eric Friedfeld. I work for Brown University. I'm actually a manager of purchasing and 
um, purchasing and technology services at the chemistry department. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've been in that field for a long time. I just, you know, I'm taking this course mostly as a way to just broaden my horizons. I've always been interested in technology and how it can make our lives easier. And when this stuff about chat GPT came out, I was like, oh my God, this is unbelievable. And I just, I'm very excited to, to learn more about it. That's great. Welcome, Eric. Thank you. Rebecca, you are next up. Hello. Hi there. Um, I'm Rebecca Rex. I work at Brown University. I'm the senior director of the Office of Corporate and Foundation Relations. And as such, I um, I have, um, as part of my responsibilities, I have oversight of the university's portfolio of um, humanities and social sciences projects, relationships within, um, with uh, private foundations. Yeah. Um, so that includes places like Watson, the University Library, the Brown Arts Initiative, wow. um, et cetera. I also manage the uh, research and stewardship functions um, of our team. Um, I've been doing this work for almost 10 years. Um, and I'm taking this course because I'm really in two things. First of all, I'm interested in just learning about what it means to get my mind to work in more innovative ways, yeah. if that makes sense. Absolutely. And I'm also, I also, um, you know, when I go to um, um, conferences, our industry conferences and whatnot, I'm starting to hear about how um, some of our peer institutions are using different types of technology to do the work that um, my team is engaged in. And I'm really right. interested to see um, just what there is to pick up about that. And if there are um, yeah. new tools that I can adopt yeah. and bring back. I have no doubt there are, Rebecca. I'm, I'm sure there are, okay? I think there are new tools for all of you, which is interesting. Thank you, Rebecca. Tracy, hello. Hi, Tracy Jordan. I also work at Brown University. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm in the finance department, so I'm the director of payroll services and foreign national taxation. Mm -hmm. um, so pretty much, you know, interacting with staff, um, students as well. Um, many uh, foreign nationals need a lot of um, extra information and, and guidance through the process because it's difficult for them. Um, we have, they have specific tax treaties and um, rules in regards to payment and taxation. Uh, and then on the payroll side, um, we recently, well, already eight months ago, we uh, went live with adding more states. So we had added nine states. So now we have 12 states that uh, were registered in to conduct payroll. So it's been, been always, it's always changing, always a lot going on. Um, so I guess I, I always hear about AI and certain technologies from my son because he's very much into right. computer science. So I think it's more of like learning how to be creative in the, the business yeah. application of it for me, um, especially in the, in a field where you are very regulated and, right. and you need to be, of course, but um, also be able to balance that with some um, efficiencies with using it yeah. too. That's great. And I think I love that you said both creativity and efficiency, right? I think the good news is you get the best of both worlds, right? You, because you can be more efficient, it frees up time to allow you to work on things that you may not have had time to think about before. And therefore you can take more, you know, more time to be creative about solutions. So that's perfect, Tracy. And is your son studying uh, computer science now at university or is, is he just interested? He's, he's in high school, but yeah. he is in their computer science um, right. program there. He's in 11th grade, so he's yeah. taking an AP course for it. And um, the program partners with URI, so he's in a yeah. URI cybersecurity class too. That's great. Yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, he's future proofing himself at, already. That's great. Mm -hmm. Well, welcome, Tracy. And so now okay. I have Julie. Hello, Julie. Well, she put a note in saying she's working at a public library, so she okay. 
Okay. All right, no worries. Okay, Julie, we will we will certainly understand that. So we'll we'll catch up with you later. Okay. All right, Vanessa, hello. Yep. Okay, we'll circle back. Okay, we'll circle back. No, no pressure, no rush. All right. Thank you, Bethany. Hi. Hey, I have to take myself back off mute. Uh, I'm super excited to be here. So I joined Brown um, 11 months ago. I am uh, a senior project manager in IT. I came to Brown from Accenture. Um, yeah. I've really, I think, spent the past 15 years of my career driving change and innovation. Yeah. Wow. Um, I'm just here to learn some new tools and geek out and um, <laughs> would you say future proof a few times were my favorite books from the past few years. If, cool. you have, if anyone on here hasn't read it, please do. <laughs> it's future proof nine rules for humans in the age of automation. Uh, New York times technology author, Kevin Roos. Yeah. Kevin's um, amazing. Yeah. Uh, and if you, if you don't listen to Kevin's podcast, I don't know if you know, Kevin does a podcast every Friday with uh, Casey Newton called hard fork. Um, and it's absolutely no. one of my favorite podcasts. It's, it, it's right. a, it normally goes for an hour to an hour and a quarter, and they go very deep, right? I'm it to my list. Yeah, and they they know everybody in Silicon Valley, so there's no one that won't talk to them. Very cool. And so, what did you do at Accenture? Were you driving? Were you project managing there and working with clients? Uh, I actually was leading a global transformation organization. Um, I was on the Microsoft account. And yeah. so, uh, you know, we had teams on five different continents and um, my role was to make sure we were executing change and finding ways to work better. Um, certified Lean Six Sigma, uh, yeah. PMP, uh, Gallup Strengths Coach. So I'm really um, geek out on like driving engagement throughout change. And, um, and I made the choice to come to Brown because I couldn't wait to get out of my house again and be yeah. around people. Right. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm excited about all the changes we're, we're doing in IT at Brown. And I have to call out Eric. Eric, your wife is one of my favorite people. Tell Maggie <laughs> I said hello. That's great. That's great. Thank you so much, Bethany. All right, so now we've got Owen. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, thanks so much, Mike, for this time to introduce ourselves. Uh, my name is Owen Myers. I work with a nonprofit research organization called the Pacific Institute for Research and Evaluation. I am a research associate, and we do a lot of work in the behavioral health space, particularly in prevention. So right. I work in substance use disorder prevention, uh, crisis prevention, and uh, I do a lot of my work in Ohio. So I'm coming to you from Columbus. Okay. Um, I'm stoked to be here. Uh, I'm really interested in uh, learning uh, just about uh, accelerating change, particularly in the space um, like uh, research implementation uh, and the work that I do. Uh, there's a lot of, I think, opportunity for this type of change. So um, I'm excited to learn from you all and That's great. glad to be here. So Columbus is the home of the Ohio State University. Um, are you a member of... Uh the community there or working in an independent institution? The nonprofit is not associated with Ohio State? Yes. So we are not associated with OSU. I am an OSU graduate. Um, yeah. Okay. Technically, my office is out of Louisville, Kentucky. Okay. Um, and we have offices around the country, including I think close to you guys in Rhode Island. So yeah. um, we have an, a national presence. That's great. Well, welcome to the classroom. Vanessa? Up still struggling. Okay, no worries, Vanessa. We'll we'll make sure we get you eventually. Okay, you're we're not going to let you get away with uh, not introducing yourself. So when you figure it out, we're good. Okay, all right, Alexander. Hi. Oh, Mike. Alexander is your media services Zoom. Oh, bud. okay. All right, because I see the Brown alumni thing. All right, thank you. All right, really so crucial member of the team, though. Thank you, Alex. All right, thank you, Melissa. Hi. Yeah. So I work at the Office of Sustainability and Resiliency here at Brown. Yeah. Um, and a big part of my role is managing our interns as well as uh, other projects for the office. So I'm mainly interested in 
using AI, um, not just for like researching um, for my own work, but managing a team of undergraduate and graduate students that will be using it in different capacities for research or data work, um, writing, all that. That's great. So Melissa, with, with this group of interns, right, these people are sort of the the perfect demographic for using chat GPT and other generative AI tools. Are you already seeing some of these interns putting this technology to use in their daily work with you? Uh, not yet. So I'm kind of building the the program from the ground up right now. Um, yeah. So it, it's kind of our, our first big cohort at the moment, but I do anticipate some of them are probably already familiar, um, whereas others, it might be a matter of teaching it to them to a degree. Okay. Great. Thank you. John, are you, um, I don't see a last name, John. Are you part of the cohort? Yes, I am. My name is John Mendoza. I'm from California. Yeah. Um, I... And John, John, if I may stop you, your, your audio connection is quite shaky right now. Um, are you on Wi-Fi? Yes, I'm on Wi-Fi. That's the only one, the only thing I have. Okay. Well, can you try to just speak a little bit louder and closer to the microphone so we can hear you? Because it's a little wobbly. Yes. My name is John Mendoza. I'm from California. My education and training is in city and regional planning. Mm -hmm. I was a county planner for five years and an air quality planner for almost two years with Clark County, Las Vegas. Uh, I want to get more tools for my toolkit. Okay, that's great. Well, we, we certainly want to give you more tools to work on. Welcome. And what part of California specifically are you dialing in from? Central California. Okay, thank you. Joshua, hello. Hi there. Uh, I'm Joshua Spicer. I am uh, the Director of Strategic Communications at the Brown University Kearney Institute for Brain Science, which is kind of the way we talk about it is kind of the, the makerspace, the workshop where people come across from across the university to address and really try and uh, tackle and, and, and work on issues related to brain science. So we do a lot in yeah. Alzheimer's, we do a lot in memory, pain, um, anything you can think of, uh, Kearney is a place where it happens. And I think part of the reason I'm interested in the class is that um, we're a pretty sprawling part of the university in the sense that we have 250 affiliated faculty across the university, yeah. um, many of whom are really interested in the translational nature of, of brain research. So bringing something from an idea to actually to the marketplace. Yeah. Um, I have a lot of background in that and uh, curious to figure out how some of the, the the core elements of this course might help there and also how to be nimble when it comes to employing AI. That's great. In the in the translational nature you're involved with, is it more licensing? Is it startup formation? A little bit of both? Yeah, it's a little bit of both, really. Um, you know, of course, we're part of the university, so it's not a, a for-profit venture, but right. that's the kind of a, uh, the, the on the minds of everyone. The, the way we use the terminology used is from, you know, the bench to the bedside. Yeah. So thinking yeah, about absolutely. that sort of thing. That's a very large uh, group of faculty member that you're affiliated with. Very interesting. Yep. Well, welcome, Joshua. Very interesting. Thank you. All right. So as I as I roll my way through the gallery, um, I am now looking at um, Cheryl Weissman. Cheryl, are you available? And Cheryl, you are muted if you're talking. I don't know if you know that, but you are muted if you are in fact trying to communicate. I can. Okay, Cheryl, I'm going to assume you're not right available right now, and I'm going to keep moving. I see both a C. Weissman and a Cheryl. I'm going to assume that you are both of those people. Um, and I'm coming back around one last time for Vanessa Miller. And she's smiling, so something tells me she thinks she's got it this time. Is that right? I think I've got it. Can you hear you me? You got it. You got it. Okay. <laughs> you cracked the code. Oh, yeah. yeah, I did. I did. And Funnily enough, I'm going to introduce myself. I'm Vanessa Miller. I'm the technology coach for the district of Narragansett um, awesome. here in Narragansett. 
<laughs> it's a Rhode Island SOA. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Troubleshooting myself today. Um, so I work in the very small district of Narragansett. So we only have three schools, an elementary, a middle, and a high. So I do get to work with um, teachers uh, pre-K to 12. Yeah. Um, and also special projects um, that involve the students. Um, so a lot of my job has been in the past couple of years has been organizing a list of safe apps for our students and teachers to use. Um, so as well as helping with um, any of the efforts that our director of technology has been working on with um, cybersecurity um, and uh, just making sure everything works in the district for our students. Right. Um, so I'm here to learn more about how AI is going to affects, affect the education industry yeah. as a whole at K to 12. Right. Um, what can I, how can I leverage that as a technology coach um, to support, I think, primarily first my teachers and then yeah. explore um, what possibilities there might be for students in the future. That's great. And when you talk about your teachers, your stakeholders, right? Um, I, I know that there's been a lot of emotional um, pushback on Gen AI, right, as it came out and, you know, especially with students, you know, using it to do their homework and, and all that. So wh what would you say is the sort of the, the current state of mind of your teacher stakeholder? Are they bullish? Are they neutral? Or are they very concerned at this point? Is it a mix? I think they're neutral because that's the message we've been pushing out right now. Um, yeah. So we haven't really... Uh, we didn't respond by, you know, um, telling the teachers they're not allowed to explore it. We did block right. uh, chat GPT for our students because the terms of use are 18 plus. And that's right. really the reasoning we used immediately um, yeah. as we figure this thing out. Um, and so I think we're trying to push forth and, and me as a coach, when I interact with the teachers, like I'm, I'm an explore mode, let's find this yeah. out. So I, we do have a couple of teachers that, um, got really into it this summer and are very excited to share what they found out. Yeah. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna continue the learning. So with this course, and we have uh, some teachers enrolled in ISTU's AI course, and as well as you know a few going to MassQ to check out what's available there. And yeah. I think we're gonna come back together and collaborate, put our heads together, so that we can do just an overall like what's going on with AI. Um, to the to the district, and then I let teachers kind of explore. I think. Yeah, I I love it. Just let everybody kind of go off, discover, come back, bring back what they've learned, share with one another, and and begin to experiment. Right, because it's we're in experimentation phase. So that's great. Well, welcome. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone who has not other than Julie who is um, Julie? I'm going to get you a set of headphones because holding that phone for 90 minutes, you're you're going to get tired. Um, so anyway, are we coming through loud and clear on the phone, Julie? Great. Okay, cool. Is there anybody who has not yet had a chance to say hi before we move forward? I uh, do love the diversity. Uh, there's, you know, obviously there's a, a strong Brown influence in the classroom, which I love. Um, love the growth mindset. So let's, uh, let's get into this, right? And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on my background because I think you, you have a good idea of what I've done professionally, and it, it will, you know, and obviously Allison did an incredible job of connecting me uh, with you guys as she set up the, the the intro. But over time, some of my responsibilities will probably come out just so I can share different experiences with you, right? So listen, you know, at the end of the day, right, we have to understand that we are living in an era of accelerated change. And it is impossible to overstate, right? 20 or 30 years ago, you know, geeks like me, and I love that Bethany wants to geek out, right? We lived in this somewhat esoteric world where, you know, we started tech startups, but we, we lived in this little bubble, right? And thanks to Steve Jobs, right? He has democratized technology. And technology now is at the very core of our economy, our society, and, and it it's certainly at the core of every organization that we work for. And so we are absolutely affected by advances in technology at an individual level, at an organizational level, and even at a country level. So for example, I was in India last week. I just got back. And I was with one of the largest automotive uh, companies in the world, a company called Stellantis. 
you may or may not know the brand, but you'll know the underlying brands, Alfa Romeo and Maserati and Jeep, Chrysler, Plymouth, Dodge Ram, Citroen, Peugeot, right? And the reason I mention this is because, you know, they are in the midst of, you know, this massive electric vehicle transition. And they have been incredibly conservative. And as a result of that, they're really, really struggling. Okay, now Germany, who has always been sort of the, the engine of the European Union economy, not surprisingly, a very significant number of people in Germany are employed in the automotive sector. If not directly for OEMs like BMW and VW and Audi, um, they're working for one of the tier one or tier two suppliers. And unfortunately, Germany has been very slow to react to this massive once in a century transformation to electric vehicles from internal combustion engines. And the country is really in very serious economic jeopardy right now. They are the poorest performing country in the European Union, which is a shock because they've always been at the lead. And I think we're going to see a significant amount of unemployment in Germany over the next 10 years, which is going to cause a lot of economic and political havoc, right? And so the reason I mention this is because we are all affected in one way or another. If, if we are not as a nation, if we are not as an organization, as a department, as a team, or as individuals, being intentional about keeping up with the pace of change, we will wind up sort of in the ditch on the side of the road. And so I think for all of us, right, we are living in a free agent economy. And yes, we might be working for an Accenture or a Brown or a nonprofit or the Narragansett School District. Um, but increasingly, we're seeing more and more changes in the way that organizations um, exhibit loyalty to their employees. And so, you know, what if if this course does anything, it's going to make you more aware when you listen to the news. It's going to make you a lot more aware of how changes that may seem like, oh, that's just something that's important in Silicon Valley, or that's just something that's important in academic research. No, it's really becoming something that all of us need to be very, very aware of. Okay. So, you know, the way that we set up the course, right? We we want to give you the insights and to help you reframe your own mental models so that you can begin to take ownership of your own careers, okay? And to the extent that you are in leadership positions, you know, you can begin to put into place initiatives and run experiments so that you can begin to create a, an innovation mindset, right? Because at the end of the day, it comes down to mindset. It comes down to values. It comes down to culture, right? And, and this is only something that can be driven by leadership. So if you are in a leadership position, um, it's incumbent upon leaders now more than ever to really be able to communicate their vision uh, for how we're going um, to innovate, to keep the organization vibrant, but also to be an attractive place to work. I know that one of the folks said that, you know, you're managing a lot of, you know, interns, right? Graduate and graduate students, and they are increasingly demanding, right? They want to work in visionary, and Bethany's laughing, right? I'm sure you had a lot of, you know, young graduates come work for you, right? They want to be working with the most um, advanced technologies, right? They want to be working at the forefront of change. They also care very much about organizational values. Um, but, you know, if we're going to retain great people, um, first attract and then retain great people, then we're going to have to offer them something really interesting. Okay. And so what we're trying to do is say, we want you to go from playing defense to the extent that you were playing defense to playing offense, right? That you are not being disrupted, but you are beginning to think about how you can start to set the agenda for your industry. Okay. Your sector. Now, I will tell you that, you know, when when I worked with Allison to set up the course, one of the one of the readings that I had asked you guys to read tonight is from Ethan Mollick, who was a professor at uh, U, U Penn Wharton. 
And that was from December. And I cannot tell you just from December how much things have changed, right? So I'm, you know, I'm going to give you a lot more things to look at to the extent that you have the, the appetite to look at. Okay. I could overwhelm you with podcasts and blogs and magazines and books, and that's not my intention. But I know some of you are going to want to go beyond, you know, what we, we agreed we would have th no more than three light readings for the, each class, right? We're not trying to overwhelm you. We recognize you all have day jobs and lives. But if you want to, to do far more exploration, trust me, uh, I can give you a homework assignment like no other, okay? We'll get you deep, okay? And so with that, um, I'm going to, I think I'm going to leave this alone. I want to really get into the meat of the program right now. So why don't we just do that instead? Okay. I think you guys know what this, what you bought into, right? So we're, we've broken this into four key elements, right? So this tonight, and we're going to do it for the, the, uh, the next three Wednesday nights at five o'clock, right? We're going to talk a lot about fa factors that drive disruption. Okay. And let's be clear. Disruption is not new. Disruption has been around since uh, the industrial revolution, but it is accelerating at a pace that no one has ever seen before. And then we're going to talk about the tools to give you the opportunity to unlock new possibilities as disruption sort of makes its way into society, into the economy. And so that you're harnessing disruptive technologies. You're not being whipsawed by them. And then we're going to talk about how to create a, a cultivate a creative culture. I taught a course at Harvard this summer. Harvard had asked me to create this course. I, I created it from a clean sheet of paper around creativity. In fact, I'm giving a lecture at Berkeley tonight to a group of PhD engineers on creativity. I'm going to really try to put them out of their comfort zones tonight. So wish me luck with that. Okay. But creativity is the, it is the catalyst. It is the the first part of an innovation process, right? The whole point of innovation is to create novel solutions, right? Unique, differentiated solutions. And that means that the front end of the process, we want to be thinking very, very, um, you know, it may sound cliche, but out of the box, right? Elon Musk, I'm sure many of you know that just yesterday, a biography was written by the great biographer, Walter Isaacson, and he had two years to follow Musk around. And Musk is obviously a very controversial figure, but the one thing you can certainly say about Musk is he doesn't let, like someone at one point said, you know, gravity could be a problem. He goes, don't worry, we're gonna figure it out, right? He doesn't let any constraints prevent him from devising novel solutions, right? When people, when he told everyone, when he built SpaceX, that you know we're going to be the first organization to send a rocket into space and actually allow it to land on the earth and then reuse it again people thought he had lost his mind so he gets back to first principles right and that's a lot of what creativity is right nothing is impossible what is it what problem are we trying to solve and no idea is too radical too crazy in order to drive some level of innovation. So we're gonna talk a lot about creativity. And the thing you wanna know about creativity is we were all born to be creative. And then um, this may not be something that uh, Vanessa wants to hear, but a lot of elementary schools really um, do a heck of a job of having us conform. And a lot of our creative skills are lost between the ages of five and 15. But the good news is creative confidence is like any other muscle. If you exercise it, you can build that muscle mass back up. So we're going to talk about how to do that. And then we're going to talk about, you know, okay, we've, we've had, you know, uh, our time together. Now, how do you take the learnings of this course? How do you take the tools that we've covered, the frameworks that we've discussed, the readings that we've gone through? And then bring that back into our own careers and into our organization so that we can begin to put this stuff for work to work in a way that is beneficial to us. Okay. And so, you know, we have people from, you know, as I looked at the registration list, and I think we have 
maybe some additional people that have joined, but we obviously have a lot of people from the educational world, both Narragansett and Brown University. We've got people that came out of professional services, manufacturing, uh, the nonprofit world, the research world. So, you know, there's a lot of diverse perspectives here, which is awesome because we're going to learn from one another. Okay. So we talked about your learning objectives. So I'm not going to go through a lot of that, right? We, you know, some of the things that had been written down, want to learn new skills, learn about new technologies, learn how to leverage tech in my business, you know, help my faculty use chat GPT. And, and one of my favorites that I don't have here is I want to geek out. Okay. Always a good time to geek out, right? So, so let's talk about how we harness key factors driving disruption, okay? And I'm going to skip right over this. So now let, let us talk about these readings and assignments, okay? So why don't we start off by the Berkeley Innovation Index? Did anybody happen to complete the Berkeley Innovation Index, right? It's a very simple five-minute self-assessment that try okay so Vanessa's giving me her thumbs up so who wants to share you know what you might have come up with um and and any questions you might have as a baseline for us getting started anybody want to share your uh your score I'll share and there's it. no such thing as a bad score by the way okay <laughs> this is not a test I think I heard someone. Yeah, I'm happy to share. It's Bethany. Please. Yeah, hey. Um, so my personal innovation mindset level is currently 83.29000001 out of 100. I love it. Okay. And I thought it was interesting kind of digging into the subscores. Um, yep. You know, like I consider myself a highly collaborative person, but it was actually yeah. kind of the lowest area of my scores, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. And I think afterwards I was thinking about like that collaborating with your competitors Yeah, where I was like, of course you're not going to do that. And yeah. in yeah. hindsight, I was like, oh yeah, okay. So I'm yeah. interested to learn more about like what this means. Yeah, I mean, it's a very, and the question you raise is probably one of the most interesting, right? I mean, it, it seems like almost unnatural. Am I going to collaborate with my competitor or not? But, but when you look at a lot of trade associations, right, and you look at sort of the need for the industry, right, a rising tide lifts all boats. And so there's a lot of co-opetition, right? Not everybody has to play that Coke and Pepsi game where it's just, there's just absolute animosity. Or, you know, it used to be for many, many, many years, Intel would never, nobody at Intel could ever utter the words AMD, okay, which was just silly, okay, because the semiconductor industry, especially in the United States, and we're seeing, you know, this $50 billion investment now, they need to collaborate to reestablish a vibrant, you know, semiconductor capability here in the United States, right, as global supply chains collapse, right? So I think part of it comes down to the understanding of co-opetition, that not that you're going to, you know, betray your company and, and you know, give away trade secrets or IP, but are there opportunities maybe to do something with a competitor that allow you both to win, right? And I think that's something probably I bet a lot of people struggled with. It's common. It's very common. That's great. And I love the, how many decimal points did you give me there? Like 12? You almost got to pie, right? Yeah, it was a lot. Was great. It was a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Anybody else want to share? Again, there's no bad scores, guys. Okay. This is not a test. No one's going to judge you. So without even sharing a score, just what was something that maybe you were stronger than you might have thought? Anything jump at you say, hey, I'm actually pretty good at this. I didn't realize I was this good at this. Julie, are we now communicating telepathically to you or did you find some headphones? Okay, <laughs> great. All right, anyway, who? anybody else wanna talk about either a score that surprised them on the upside or the downside? I can go. Yeah, um, please, Owen, it's great. So I 
my score was uh, a little over 80. It was like okay. uh, yeah. point zero 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 something like like Bethany's. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and I think what was what was most interesting about it was that uh, my score in allocation was relatively low. And um, I'm, I'm just curious to maybe get the group's thoughts on resource yeah. allocation, because I think it's maybe an underrated skill. I know it's something that I um, struggle with is how to, I, I guess what I interpreted it, it as is um, the ability to delegate not only tasks, <clears throat> but resources. Um, to your team. Okay. Anybody else feel like they had a, a, a lower score on resource allocation? So Owen, do you find it difficult to delegate? Are you, do you have perfectionist tendencies? I, I think I do in some ways. Um, but I also think from the perspective of innovation, a lot of, um, what I tend to draw on my head as the caricature of an innovator is somebody who can take on all aspects of a particular problem. So to right. me, it's interesting on the index yeah. that such yeah. a strength is the ability to allocate. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, it's almost the antithesis, right? I mean, one of the things we will get into is that this is a team sport, right? That we are we are no better than, you know, the the unique skills that we bring together right? Great innovative teams are incredibly cognitively diverse, experientially diverse, gender diverse, functionally diverse teams. And the leader is willing to give everyone a voice, right? That anybody at any time could be the leader of that group, right? It's very situational. Someone might be the expert. So it's it's not at all about, um, you know, I have to be the expert, right? That is, yes, you do have a Steve Jobs, you do have a uh, Elon Musk, but we're, you know, most people um don't fall into that category right most of us are we need to really bring together a great team of people and trust them to be able to innovate okay anybody else want to comment on this because i what all i want to ask you to do just be aware of how you scored keep this in you know the back of your mind think about as we go through the class how certain things that you're learning might help you rethink reframe some of your answers because we are going to come full circle back on the last session and ask you to take these things again. Okay. All right. So let me go back here. So one of my favorite quotes is this one from Alvin Toffler. He is a neighbor here in the Boston area, which is where I'm dialing in from. He's a futurist. And the illiterate of the 21st century are not those that cannot read and write, right? That's just table stakes. It's those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn, right? And if you think about the movie, The Men in Black, and you think about that little strobe light that Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones would flash into the eyes of someone who had an, an encounter with an alien, and they would flash that light and it would erase their memory of that encounter, right? That's almost what we need to do, right? The number of times that I have heard, we've always done it that way, or the number of times that I have heard that, you know, it worked the last time, um, it makes me cringe. And so, you know, I've been in this industry for 25 years. Literally everything has changed. Okay. And, and I have seen this all too often with people in large organizations um, that they've gotten increasingly further and further away from customers, from product design, and they just don't stay very current. And so we need to be willing to admit that some of the skills that we, we learned and worked hard to, to learn may not be serving us any longer, okay? And you don't want to be carrying around all of these bags that are just full of dead weight that, don't use, that you don't use anymore. So this is the kind of class that hopefully is going to help you to reframe the way you think about some of the skills and possibly put some of them to rest, right? Say, okay, those have served me. It got me to where I am, but it's not going to serve me going forward, okay? All right, I'm going to skip this stuff. This was my own score. And, you know, not surprisingly, um, where, where I came in low, and, and, and I have seen a lot of intellectual property theft, okay? And so my trust score, is my lowest score, okay? 
I, I love diverse teams. I mean, I, I go out of my way to em, embrace diverse teams. I'm absolutely confident that if you bring the right team together, you are going to be successful. There is no question about it. Okay. I love to collaborate across industries, across functions. Um, but I do struggle sometimes with, you know, do you, can you really trust someone if you're sharing IP with them? Right. So that's one of the areas that I really struggle. That's the one that brings my score down a bit. Okay. And so none of us, none of us are going to ever score a hundred. Okay. All right. So now one of the things that we're beginning to see, oh yeah, please. And, and Bethany, you, you know, you have that little icon, right? So it'll be because your hand might blend in with the, the taupe wall, just use your hand icon, please go ahead. Okay. In the reactions. So yeah. June had a good question. She put it in the chat. Yeah. Um, related to the Toppler quote. Yes, please. Um, so, it, you know, but those who cannot learn, unlearn and relearn, like what, what does he mean by unlearn? Well, unlearn means that I think I, I tried to cover that, right? Unlearn means we we used to do something in a certain way. We used to use a certain process. We used to have a certain playbook. Okay. Let me give you a very simple example. Okay. Um, in the world that I grew up in, which is the world of enterprise software, one of the things that, you know, the business model would always call for would be a very senior level direct sales team. Okay. And, and, and hiring salespeople is very expensive. Okay. You, you pay them their salary, their commission, they get company cars and they're traveling constantly because they're out meeting clients. And as a result of that, you know, they are a huge cost to the organization until they become productive and start generating sales. There came a point when, you know, when the internet became a lot more stable, um, that venture capitalists absolutely refused to make investments in startups that relied on expensive direct sales forces, that they, there was enough advances in technology that you could do a lot of this work over things like Zoom right or or through a wide range of other online types of uh, vehicles right you could give demos and you could give presentations and so almost overnight we went from it was it, there was no question that you had to have a large direct sales force to achieve your revenue goals to we will never touch a company that has burned it itself with such an incredibly high cost structure okay and there are a lot of startup founders that miss that memo. And so they're out there raising money with a model that was no longer in favor. And as a result of that, they could not raise money. And many of them starved on the vine. They just went away, right? So just, just a simple example of what unlearning might be. Okay, another unlearning, and you must know this one, is going from sort of the cascade, the waterfall to the lean method, right? Or, you know, from you know, from, from a hierarchical approach to an agile scrum approach, right, to development, right? So, so there's many, many, many different, you know, examples that we might cite about unlearning, okay? Does that help everyone? Anybody else want to follow up on that question? And guys, forgive me, I'm, I'm not looking at the chat. Um, so if there is a question in the chat, you, you can just raise your hand, just go to the icon, raise your hand and just shout out, okay? That's, you know, we have a, the luxury of a small cohort here. So one of the things that we're starting to see, we have been seeing, right? And we've begun to see it as far back as the mid nineties with the birth of Netflix, with the birth of Amazon, is we have moved into this realm of what is called the exponential organization, right? If you go back to the industrial age, companies could only sell what they made, right? So if you made something and then you sold it, so there was a very linear relationship between the company's capacity and its ability to grow. And the world, the physical world, the world of atoms, the world of electrons. But beginning in the mid nineties, when the Netscape uh, company dropped the Mosaic browser and the World Wide web became real, the digital era really began. And then, of course, in 2007, in early 2007, with the launch of the iPhone, it really began to accelerate. And so what you started to see were organizations that were growing exponentially. 
And so if you look at the, the growth of Facebook, the growth of Instagram, right? The growth of Airbnb, the growth of Uber, right? These were low asset companies, right? They were benefiting from network effects. So Uber wasn't, you know, Uber never owned a single car. Airbnb never owned a single hotel. And yet they created this ecosystem around them that generated massive network effects so that every new node on the network brought value. And you started to see organizations grow at rates of, of, of change that was just previously thought to be impossible. And so a lot of more traditional organizations now struggle to keep pace with these platform companies, right? And yet we have no choice but to try to replicate some of the things that, that they do that make them so successful, that make them so profitable, that make them so influential, if we're going to have any hope of competing with them long term. So, you know, so certainly leadership transformation, this was why I was in uh, India last week, you take the top 35 members of the leadership team of a big auto company, and you start thinking about, okay, how do we apply generative AI and machine learning to our business? Okay. You begin to collaborate with, make corporate venture capital investments in, or actually acquire organizations that have exponential capabilities. You leverage the kind of disruptive technologies that we're going to talk about in this classroom, right? And then you kind of translate that, you, you interpret that, you tailor that to what is, you know, XO, you know, exponential organization light in your organization, whether it be a, a public school system in Narragansett whether it be a major Ivy League institution like Brown or whatever it might be, okay? So that's part of what we're going to be thinking about, okay? And so it does come down to culture, right? I mean, yes, you could have the best coders in the world. You could have the best technologists in the world, but if you don't give them a fertile environment to innovate, to create and innovate, it simply doesn't matter, okay? And so let me ask all of you in the room, when you think about obstacles that maybe prevent you from being as creative or innovative as you'd like to be, what are some of the obstacles that come up? Because they're, these are very real, right? And, and the reading on, you know, companies do innovation theater was exactly aimed at this discussion. Yeah, so Bethany, please. Well, I think it is that just like resistance to change, right? Like yeah. leadership saying, I don't see the value. This is how we do it. This is where I'm comfortable. And yeah. I would imagine to some extent that comes from, you know, uh, risk aversion. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think in, in the past year at Brown, um, some of the things have been like, okay, we'll slow down. Like, we'll get there. We'll get there, you know? Right. Um, right. And yeah. so the pace of change is, is different. Yeah, I'm sure it's very different than Accenture, right? I'm sure Accenture was hair on fire change, right? Just clients' hair is on fire. And you had a sense of urgency to drive your clients forward, right? So I'm sure that was a, a significant cultural shift for you, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Rebecca, hi. Hi. Um, for me and um, what I observe um, among across my team, it mm -hmm. seems to be um, a lack of resources, namely time that gets yeah. in the way of creativity. And I recognize that that's more of a structural issue yeah. than anything right. else. But um, yeah, yeah that's, so, that's so let me ask you this. Have you ever tried to sit down with the team? And, and kind of review what they're working on and say, I bet a lot of the things that are on your to-do list, maybe we don't need to do them any longer. Maybe they're legacy items, or maybe we don't need to do them at the level of intensity that we have, right, to free up time. I mean, so there's that old-fashioned approach, which is kind of just this triage, right? Mm -hmm. And then the other side, of course, is using generative AI which we will certainly spend a lot of time on, right? Which is making people significantly more productive, right? To free them up. So there's both the sort of the older approach, which is perfectly legitimate, um, combined with this new AI driven approach, right? Mm -hmm. And if you combine both of those, it, it could have some really profound 
uh, influence on on freeing up time for the team, right? Is there anything that is obvious to you that's like, you know what, maybe we don't really need to be doing this as much as we as we are? Is anything jump out? Um, there are a few things, but um, to go back to your previous paragraph um, yeah. related to using AI, that is sort of an interesting segue into the other element that I find on my team, which is I'm not ever going to let a machine do my job. I mean, we uh, all, my team is, um, we, there's a, it's very writing intensive. Right, right. And so okay, there's that. All right. Now that's interesting, right? Now I, I understand that, right? And yet I will say that it, you know, it, it's an attitudinal thing, right? Which is you're, you're not letting the machine do your job. You're ha having the machine help you to do your job better. And I realized that is a fundamental shift in mindset. And this is going back to the learn and unlearn and relearn, right? And, and the understanding that for better or worse, um, it's an uncomfortable change, especially for people who love to write. Um, but for better or worse, we now have an assistant that is pretty good at writing and can give us a very good first draft that we can then challenge. We can go back and edit, right? And and again, I know that you know everyone's going to come at this from their own perspective, but but it is it's that kind of thinking that sometimes prevents positive change from happening, mm -hmm. right? So let me give you an example, right? In the world of computer software, right, um, we have seen what is called pair programming now for several years, and what that means is, right, long before you may have heard of ChatGPT, it was made available through a very, very significant software repository called GitHub. You may never have heard of GitHub, but it's very, very popular, right? And so for over two years now, starting in July of 2021, you could actually go into GitHub and it would suggest software code that you could write. And as a result of that, what we're seeing is that software developers are seeing 50 to 100% improvements in productivity. Um, and they're, you know, they're loving it, right? Because th there's, there's never enough time to code. And so, you know, no one's looking at them and saying, oh my God, you're cheating because you're using this automated approach to write code. They're saying, this is great, right? So I'm very actively involved in the MIT CIO symposium. And a lot of the leading CIOs in the world are members and as far back as April, they were they were incredibly optimistic about how much more productivity they saw out of their teams, right? So this would be an interesting offsite discussion for you, Rebecca, to have, right? Is to you know to really understand why they would be so um, reticent, and maybe some of the people on your team will be champions, and they will say, you know what, it's actually making me a more effective employee. So anyway. Um, you know, it's, it's a, but I really appreciate you raising the issue. It's very common, absolutely very common. All right. So let me ask you, who wants to comment on the reading about innovation theater? Did that, did that strike a chord with anybody? You know, performative innovation versus real innovation, right? We're going to go through the motions. We're going to, we're going to pretend that we're innovators, but you know what? We're not, but boy, we're going to convince others. Yeah. Joshua, please. I like the idea they know we're having a hackathon, you know, that's, yeah. that, that's pretty in vogue. And, and this isn't necessarily, you know, uh, restrictive to my organization, but, right. um, cause I do think we're, we're, we, we do have our foot, foot feet facing forward, but yeah, that seems to be the, uh, in vogue. We're having a hackathon or we're yeah. a maker space or what have you. And right. that's all well and good, but right. what goes on from there? That's exactly right, Josh. So Joshua, I have led over 200 hackathons. And the way you can distinguish between a company that is doing innovation theater versus really innovating is the companies that are doing innovation theater, the hackathon is a sugar high. For three days, they're all excited and you know they're pounding their chest. This was awesome. And then you go back to your desk and you do the same old stuff that you've always done. And you've actually done harm to your organizational culture because you've given your employees the belief that, you know what? We are going to be able to, you know, have our voices heard, have our creativity highlighted, as opposed to those organizations that they take the output of that hackathon, and on Monday they're starting to figure out how to build on it, right? 
So yes, it's not that there's anything inherently wrong with doing hackathons or design sprints or you know maker spaces, but you're absolutely right. It, it's it's got to be integrated into the workflows of the team. So that's great. Thank you, Vanessa. I'm going to call on you. Hey, um, thank you. Hi. Uh, so what really stuck out for me from this article was the just having the innovation strategy as a guide. So you know right. I've been stuck in this loop many times throughout my career um, as a K-12 educator uh, where we are going to make a big change. We need to make a big change in a certain area, for example, scheduling, right? right. And ending up back where we started after all the research, looking at things, trying to, you know, put together something new that'll meet the needs that we outlined, just ending up back where we were and saying, here we go. Here's our new schedule. That's exactly where we started in the beginning. So having why, that like why vision- is that? Why, after all this work that you put in, why, why are you going back to the drawing board again and again? What is it just people don't want it to was, change? It was fear. Of, I think it was fear of change. Absolutely fear of change. So even though, and I want to, I want to just be clear. We do have a brand new schedule in yeah. Narragansett that is very different and very innovative. I'm talking yeah. about a previous version of trying to yeah. change it. Yeah. Um, so we, uh, at that point it was, it was fear of change and rather I just don't think there was like enough of a vision. So I really like the idea of having an innovation strategy, especially like yeah. in a K to 12, because I'm not sure that's something that we have. Yeah. And I would think you would want to bring in key stakeholders like the superintendent and mm -hmm. the principals and, Absolutely. you know, at least one champion, right? One faculty champion that has a passion for technology, right? And have almost a, you know, an innovation strategy council. So that, you know, you're also getting bottom up feedback from people that are on the ground in the different schools. And, and at the same time, you're very aware of what the senior leadership is thinking and you have their support. Right. I would think mm -hmm. that would be a long way toward avoiding these kind of experiences down the road. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. it's, it's hard to drive change um, as an individual. OK, it really is in any industry, but certainly in the educational industry. OK, cool. All right, Bethany, please. Yeah, so I I didn't appreciate. Yeah, I guess that you know it's kind of like like you know giving the impression process is bad, and yeah, I've right. worked with a lot of people like this that like process slows us down. But if you don't have process, you you don't yeah. have innovation. You have chaos. Yeah. So so I think it's important to tease this out by saying like good process where you are continuously, continuously improving, where you're looking at what's working, what isn't breaking it open, talking yeah. to people, but this makes it seem like, yeah, process just stifles. And yeah. I and, and I mean, you know, Steve Blank, as you may know, right. Very, very prolific writer. Right. And I think yeah, he's, he's trying to make a point. Right. And I think the, the message I take away, and I saw this last week in India, right. That, that sometimes process becomes the God that we worship and, and it over, and it becomes sort of the overarching, you know, this is what we find ourselves genuflecting to. Right. And I think the message is just enough process. Right. So sure. let's be clear. Innovation is messy. Creativity is messy. Right. So there's only so much process you can wrap around the very early fuzzy front end of innovation. But there's no question once you start to scale, right, if you move from that creativity role to the innovation role and you're try now trying to scale, yes, process becomes important. But Not too much process. Yeah, but that's what I mean. Like, I think process is important yeah. for the innovation itself. To, like you said, like, okay, we're going to have a hackathon coming out of that. We're going to do this, this, and this, right. and this. I mean, yeah. having some structure. Um, but he, and I appreciate, like, you know, he made some, some, I think intentionally provocative statements, yeah. you know, yeah. but uh, I was like, wait a minute, you need, we need some process. Like, yeah, yeah, I agree. And I don't think he's saying you don't need process, right? I just think he's, you know, the way I interpret this article is you need to strike a proper balance. Okay. But I can understand that someone who has managed massive client engagements, okay, on behalf of Accenture, the world's largest and most sophisticated systems integrator, Definitely understands the importance of process. I, I completely understand that. Absolutely. All right, cool. All right. So, you know, I want to look even so even NASA, right? The people that put put men on the moon 50 years ago and now becoming much more um, assertive again, right? As we see this new race to the moon. Um, and India put a rocket, uh, you know, put, uh, you know, a, a vehicle on the moon not that long ago. 
NASA is, you, know, you can imagine the not invented here mindset of NASA. The people that have worked at NASA historically have been world-class experts at what they do. And they have always been very, very, very resistant to external people coming in to work with them. But they have finally gotten, you know, they finally unlearned something. Bethany, what they unlearned is that we can't do it on our own, right? Owen, they can't do it on their own. They need external collaboration. They need to work with partners. So there's a complete cultural transformation at NASA which is how SpaceX wound up winning a contract, okay? Elon Musk is now, you know, doing a tremendous amount of R&D and experimentation on behalf of NASA. So NASA has gotten into digital transformation. Um, they are doing a lot more third-party collaboration. Um, They're doing a tremendous more, uh, tremendous amount of redefining the kind of talent that they need to accomplish the mission. They're much more of a team of teams, agile approach than they are a top-down military style hierarchical approach, right? So even an organization like NASA has gotten the message. They got the memo. They have unlearned a lot of behavior that has resulted in them becoming very stagnant, right? I mean, they, when you think about NASA, so you know, we last put someone on the moon July 20th, 1969, and the the space the uh, space shuttle program was interesting, but not really all that significant in terms of an outcome. And they're really reinventing themselves right now. And it takes strong leadership to do that. So if NASA can figure it out, we should all be able to figure it out. So, you know, what I want to show you here is that we have participated as as you know people walking the planet in six waves now six epics of innovation, beginning with the Industrial Revolution in England back in the 1780s. And each one of these waves was powered by a very small number of engineering-driven and science-driven innovations that completely changed life for the people at that time. So, of course, we went from this incredibly agrarian society to an industrial society. And if you look at photographs of the area around London, um, over the 100-year period after the Industrial Revolution, it is completely transformed. Okay? The, the city was, you know, unpaved roads, horses and, you know, uh, carriages on the roads, no lighting. Right. And after the Industrial Revolution, it changed society completely. And then, of course, steam power and the rail and steel and the ability to go very, very long distances. And we, you know, of course, think about that era when electricity became pervasive. Okay. What's interesting to note is that the, the horizontal axis is compressing, that the first wave was a 60 year wave. And the sixth in the sixth wave is, you know, a, a wave that will last about 25 years. So there's rapid acceleration. The second thing is what you'll notice is beginning in 1990, right, as the digital uh, innovation epics began, the slope of the curve has gotten much steeper, right? These exponential organizations that I've spoken about. And so change is only accelerating. And with AI, right, the fact that ChatGPT was downloaded by 100 million people in two months. And the fact that the radio was only down, it, was, it, it took 20 years for 50,000 people to have a radio, right? We're seeing just extraordinary changes in the level of adoption of technology. So this is something that, you know, when you are in the middle of it, you may not feel it. But if you look historically, you can imagine, I can just imagine my grandparents being around as electricity was being introduced, being around as the first automobiles were appearing, you know, in society and how dramatically their lives changed. Or for my father and mother, right, to, to be able to get on an airplane for the first time, commercial airliner and, and what that did, or the beginning of the electronics age. 
the ability to use calculators, for example, okay, or the ability to have, you know, um, a wide range of different consumer electronics that we brought into the home to entertain us, right? All of these things were at the very core of these waves of innovation. And what happens in these waves of innovation is there are winners and losers. And those people that are not paying attention to what's coming are the same people who go insolvent, that go out of business, right? So think about a guy like Reed Hastings, who was the founder of Netflix. Now, Netflix was founded in 1997, okay? That's a long time ago. What, what, is, what does the word Netflix, the brand Netflix, what does that represent? It's a mashup of two words, right? What, what did he intend when he named his company Netflix in 1997? So you have the net, right? You have the internet and you have flicks, which is movie. Now in 1997, the ink was still wet on the internet, okay? It had only really come into common usage just a couple of years earlier. And yet Hastings had this incredible vision. He knew that broadband internet was going to be a thing. He knew that there would come a point where you could stream movies over the internet. Now, in 1997, there were probably three people that figured that out, and he was one of them. Okay. And so it took the better part of almost 20 years to be able to stream a movie over the net without it buffering for like 44 hours, right? But he saw the beginning of that next wave, that new media wave. And companies like Blockbuster, a company I'm sure many of you probably patronized in an earlier you know, incarnation, despite the fact that it had 95% market share, had 10,000 retail stores, had contracts with every single major Hollywood studio, vaporized in just a few years. They had a failure of imagination, right? So they're just one of thousands of examples that I can share of a company that refused to look forward, saw what was happening, refused to unlearn that you had to have brick and mortar retail stores to provision movies to families and disappeared and became one of the, the great case studies of corporate um, uh, myopia of all time. And there's certainly no, no shortage of those. So, you know, one of the things, and I don't expect you guys to be technology um, aficionados, but what I do recommend is that you basically stay in touch with people that are. Okay. So this is a McKinsey chart and it's just showing you that you have a, you know, there's always going to be a range of new technologies that are going to appear on the horizon. Some of them are going to be overhyped. So we all think about Web 3.0 and cryptocurrency. And, you know, to a large extent, we have not seen that vision realized despite insane amounts of investment in startup formation. There's been a lot of hype about virtual reality for a very long time, right? So not all of these pay off, but it's important, especially in larger organizations, to be paying attention to what's coming and to be prepared for it, not to be blindsided by it. And so let's talk about Tesla, okay? This is a fascinating company, okay? They, they have escaped death. They were so close to insolvency several times, but they have really hit their stride. Now, here's what makes Tesla very interesting. What you may not recognize is you may never have seen a Tesla ad ever. Think about it. Have you ever seen a Tesla ad on a sporting game or in a magazine or in a newspaper? I can't remember ever seeing it. They spend zero on, our, on, on ads. They spend almost $3,000 per car on R&D. So look at the difference between a lot of the other major auto OEMs, brands we all know who spend significant amount of money on advertising and far less on innovation. And what's amazing about Tesla, okay, right? And we're talking billions of dollars, right? Volkswagen spends six billions of dollars every year on advertising. How about putting some of that money back into R&D, into innovation? And so here's what's really interesting about Tesla is that when you think about 
going to a configurator, let's say you're going to buy a Tesla, there are only 180 configurations of a Tesla Model 3. Now, that may sound like a lot until you look at the equivalent BMW 3 Series and you see there are 195,000 configurations. So imagine you decided you're going to buy a BMW Series 3 and you go on the BMW site and you open up the configurator, right? Your head is going to explode with all of the possibilities. So think about the complexity that it takes to produce 195,000 varieties of just one of their many, many, many vehicles, right? And so it kind of goes back just a little bit to what I mentioned to Rebecca. Can we stop doing stuff? Can we reduce the complexity of our team to make it easier to free up time to be more innovative? And then Toyota, their two most popular cars, and I'm sure you see them on the road all the time as I do, right? The Corolla and the RAV4, they're two top sellers and only 18% of their US revenue comes from these two models. 95% of Tesla's revenue comes from two models, right? So what you're seeing again is this, and this is an Elon Musk mindset, back to first principles. How do we really think about creating the most agile organization possible in order to be able to innovate, right? And no, no, we're, you know, no, none of us are working with Elon Musk, and I'm not suggesting that we ever would want to. He's a pretty mercurial guy, not a very nice guy to work with. I can tell you a lot of my students have found it to be very, very challenging to work at Tesla. But, but I think we can learn from him. We can learn from how do we create organizational structures that allow us to be far more streamlined and agile than maybe we, we should be, okay? So as a result of this, Tesla's profitability has dramatically outperformed the industry. Go figure. And what's remarkable is that the capital markets, Wall Street, NASDAQ, see this. So the market capitalization of Tesla, and this is from 2020, it is now over a trillion dollars. Tesla's market capitalization cumulative is more than the cumulative um, components of the next nine automakers combined. Okay. So you can imagine the level of value that Wall Street believes Tesla has created when it ascribes a, a valuation of well over a trillion dollars, when companies like Ford and GM and VW that sell many more vehicles have a tiny, tiny fraction, right? This is the world that we're living in. Wall Street is, is in the capital markets, right? And of course, you know, an institution like Brown, right? You're obviously constantly looking to raise money for the endowment and, and, and bringing in a lot of, you know, external financial sources. People are looking very differently at institutions today in terms of where they are putting their money, okay? And so it's, I think things will change for Tesla. Um, Tesla had the world until itself, but now we have over 500 electric vehicles on the road today. We have another 250 or 200, uh, you know, maybe 225 coming this year, another 175 coming in 24, another 150. So it, the world is going to change for Tesla. That remember, they started shipping their first electric vehicle all the way back in 2012. We're talking 11 years ago. So the world is going to change for them. But I think a lot of there's a lot to be learned from the way that they've grown this company right now. The next major significant inflection point really happened um, on these two dates, right? So these are dates to be um, really understood. When Netscape created the Mosaic browser in the summer of 1995, it allowed all of us access to what we now call the World Wide Web, which up until that time was really only available to scientific researchers and people in the, the military and defense world. And it gave us access to information that we was previously unheard of. And it made us a whole lot more productive. Now, there was a, there was a podcast I was listening to last night with one of the first journalists who started covering the internet when, of course, everybody thought it was a fad, right? And a woman by the name of Kara Swisher, who began her career with the Wall Street Journal, was one of the few that said, there is something happening here. 
And of course she was right. And it led to the birth of Amazon. It led to the birth of a completely new model around e-commerce. And of course, we all know what has happened to the retail industry. We all know what has happened to the music industry. We all know what has happened to the publishing industry, right? We can go on and on and on. But this was a profound disruption. And then lightning really struck in January of 2007 with the birth of the iPhone. Steve Jobs always had a vision of a digital lifestyle. And, you know, it began, of course, with the Mac and the very famous 1984 Super Bowl ad. But it really began to hit its stride when the iPhone and the App Store, you know, incredibly complementary assets were introduced in 2007. And when organizations started using GPS, whether it be Google Maps or um, Uber or Lyft or DoorDash or Instacart, um, and it began this incredible mobile economy that we have all, you know, participated in, right? I don't think you can overstate the impact that the iPhone and the Android have had on society. And of course, there have been many unintended consequences, but many organizations, you know, that did not keep up, right? And think about BlackBerry, right? BlackBerry, and by the way, if you ever have a chance to see the the theatrical movie Blackberry that played this summer. It's a mock documentary and it's an extraordinary level of insight into an organization that was so engineering centric, right? They were so non-user oriented that to them, it was just about building a cool device. It wasn't about this ecosystem, this incredible level of collaboration to turn the iPhone into the most powerful Swiss army knife of all time, right? With 2.4 million apps sitting in the app store. God knows how many apps are sitting on each of your phones right now, okay? And so the app economy really changed our lives as well. And then here's what's really interesting, okay? How quickly things can go wrong when they go wrong. In 1984, IBM was named the most admired corporation in America by Fortune magazine. This was the second year that they had done this survey. There was a cliche back then. Some of you probably heard it. Nobody ever got fired for buying from IBM. And what that meant was IBM was the safe choice. No, nobody could question you if an IBM project went wrong. Because of course, IBM was the, you know, they were the, the gold standard in computing. Well, it turns out that what IBM unfortunately missed is that in the period between 1982 and 1992, every single new innovation that they had been thinking about had been brought into the corporate finance function. And nobody within IBM would green light investments in a whole range of game changing innovations. And the reason is, is because the IBM organization was all about the current business, right? They, they did not yet understand that they had to constantly reinvent themselves, right? They were so, they viewed themselves as so many people did as immortal, as invincible. And so over 10 years, when you basically decide that there's no innovation for the future that is going to create more of a return than your mainframe business, you wind up with an innovation pipeline that is bone dry. And so one minute you're, you represent 5% of the market capitalization of the NASDAQ. And the next minute you were almost insolvent, okay? Which was just an extraordinary thing to see the, the mighty IBM brought to its knees and months away from insolvency. And so a gentleman by the name of Lou Gerstner came in and he, he did not do gentle surgery. He did surgery with a chainsaw. He literally had to lay off a half a million people. Imagine that, right? The city the size of Boston got laid off. IBM had to completely reinvent itself. It was an extremely painful experience. But if IBM could approach insolvency, then there's no question that any company could certainly be victimized by it. And it happened so quickly, right? And so ultimately, he pulled it off. He had to completely reinvent the company. Okay. And, and now IBM again is going through yet another 
transition because you know we're never done. It's just it's it's endless. It's relentless. And so even in it, this doesn't just happen in technology industries. This happens everywhere. So so Thomas is a uh, a, a huge private equity investor. And his message is, you know, even in more established industries, you're going to see a lot of changes. And if you're on the wrong side of that, if you're not prepared for this disruption, good luck. It's going to get very ugly very fast. So let's look at a company like General Electric, right? You, you may or may not realize that Thomas Edison, right? It used to be Edison Electric. Thomas Edison was one of the founders of General Electric. Okay. That's a heck of a legacy. And so with regard to GE, what we saw was that Back in 1912, they were one of the largest stocks on the, what was the Dow Jones Industrial Average, okay, number seven. And believe it or not, even though they had to navigate almost the entire 20, 20, uh, 20th century, they remained, they actually increased in value. They were number five on the New York Stock Exchange as late as 1995. And in the year 2000, they hit their ultimate market cap peak. They had a half a trillion dollar market cap, and they and they were still doing very well, right? This was all under the great Jack Welch. And then, unfortunately for them, right, they were not able to keep up with the demands of digital transformation. They were an industrial conglomerate, and they just couldn't figure it out. And even though General Electric was known as sort of the the ultimate um, polishing ground for American executives, right? If you were at a GE, you were an incredibly well-trained person. And many people left GE to run companies everywhere in the world, right? They were extraordinarily well-trained. But because they couldn't figure out digital transformation, you know, some of you may have followed this, but they moved their headquarters to Boston a few years ago. Um, and they are selling off their business piece by piece. And it's a sad thing to see the once great GE being basically reduced to nothing more than what is now a, a transaction company selling off its assets, right? So they spun out their healthcare division. It was a very successful spin out, but this company is, is a shadow of its former self. And, and it took a long time for them to you know, face the music. But once that digital era began, they just could not do it. And they are more or less done. So these are the kinds of things that can happen to any institution. Now, the good news for an organization like Brown, it is it's going to be one of the, you know, the great university institutions in the world, right? There's always going to be an appetite for Ivy League universities and top universities, but a lot of universities are struggling today. A lot of second and third tier universities are either insolvent or about to become insolvent. The New York Times ran a pretty significant cover story a couple of weeks ago about the massive amount of debt that some of our top public universities are facing today, right? And we're starting to see a lot of institutions um, shut down sporting teams and shut down different majors. Um, so, you know, the educational world is going through a massive level of disruption today. And it only got accelerated by what we saw during COVID and the, and the move toward a, a lot more online learning. So no industry is immune from this, okay? And so now, now we are up on artificial intelligence, okay? And I know we're coming to the end of our time, so we're going to spend a lot more time on this next week. But we are entering a brave new world, a world where, for better or not, we are going to need to make friends with these, for lack of a better word, human assistants, chatbots, you know, pick a name that you're comfortable with. But what I will tell you, right, and I have been immersed in this, this is where my research is, and I've been giving a lot of talks and doing a lot of webinars and creating courses on this stuff, is that it will have a profound impact on every industry. And most functions, right, marketing and sales will be significantly impacted. Software development will be significantly impacted. Customer service and support will be significantly impacted, right? There's going to be a lot of changes in terms of, you know, the kind of roles uh, that are going to be 
um, that are going to continue to be relevant. And of course, the creative forces, right? We see the Hollywood writer strike. We see the, the Hollywood actor strike, right? This is all about technology, okay? Uh, and this concern about being marginalized. So I, I can't imagine any role that is not going to be affected. And I think our choice is to say, we cannot be enemies of the future. We, it, it is futile to resist. Um, it may make us uncomfortable at first, but we're going to need to understand that this is a tool that can actually make us more effective, more productive, more creative. But it's a mindset shift. So we have to unlearn some stuff in order to make room for this. Okay. Now, there's been a lot of media attention around um, a number of different events, right? Some of you may remember when IBM Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov, the great Russian chess champion. Some of you may remember when IBM Watson beat the Legends of Jeopardy. Some of you re may remember when Google's DeepMind beat the world's greatest Asian strategy game player in the game was called Go. Some of you may remember, um, you know, a, a, um, a competition where the world's top 20 poker players played an algorithm that was also developed by Lib uh, Google's DeepMind called Libratus, and they lost millions of dollars, okay? The message is clear. We need to be more human. We need to have more empathy. We need to think more about being creative. We need to become better storytellers. We need to become more humanist because we can't outperform an algorithm. The algorithm has unique strengths and it will only get stronger, right? As the models get bigger, right? The models that GPT-4 have been trained on have trillions of attributes. They will continue to learn and there's no way we could ever, if we sat down tonight and tried to compete, we would never win. So the question is, how do we leverage our unique human skills as, you know, as a way to continue to contribute in ways that the algorithms never could, but to allow these algorithms to, to give us every opportunity to be the very best we can be. So let me just take a breath here and just get any questions, any thoughts, any comments. And hopefully what you have is a window into, you know, a handful, right? The automotive industry, we're going through a once in a century disruption. The digital economy uh, that was brought on by the World Wide Web and the smartphone, another profound disruption. And I don't think either of them will come close to seeing the kind of profound impact, right? And a lot of it is because this is the first time in history where a disruptive technology is going to is going to impact knowledge workers, us, right? Those of us who have university degrees, advanced degrees, um, and have always thought that yeah, no, you can't replace me, right? I I'm I am well educated. I have a, a strong work ethic. You know, the world is different, and um, and I think it's great that you're all here because it says you're taking the first step in, in acknowledging that. And how now do we turn this into our advantage? So, any questions, comments, anything that you guys want to share as a result of what? Hopefully, this just gives you a sense. Yeah, Bethany, please. Well, it goes back to what you were saying earlier too, right? Like <clears throat> that, uh, you know, what what is uniquely human that can't be. Uh, reproduced yeah. by ai and it's creativity um the book a whole new mind by daniel pink from 2006 yeah. i mean i love that guy by the way he's amazing yeah he is right yeah. but i remember reading that and he starts talking about that like what are the things that can't be offshored or outsourced well, right like find that um so yeah i mean as as scary as this is like Rebecca, I was just talking about this internally a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Um, you know, talking about introducing uh, robotic process automations into some of the process work we're doing. And, right. um, and that is scary for people, but ultimately it frees people up from some of these tasks to yeah. really use the humanness. And that's exciting. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I know that coders are much happier. The ones that are using ChatGPT are much happier. MIT did a study, and this is very interesting, Rebecca, because the study was all about um, 
writing, using ChatGPT to write. And I don't know if you saw this study that came out maybe in April now, and the study basically concluded. So two groups of writers, two groups of people were given writing tasks, and neither of them were allowed to use ChatGPT in the first go round. In the second go round, there was a control group and then one that was given access to ChatGPT. And the group of people that did have access were 30 to 40% more productive, but they also were 30 to 40% more satisfied with their work. Because to Bethany's point, it removed some of the tedium from what they did. Now, this was a very early study. If I remember correctly, there were around 300 people in the study. But it's directionally quite interesting, right, in that it addresses one of the concerns that you shared. Um, and so if you can't find that study, I'd be happy to send, you know, send a link. OK, but it just a, it's just a, a very early indication of, of how people react. I just put the link in the chat. Oh, that's great. Cool. Anybody else want to share any any thoughts, comments, takeaways from this evening? OK, I guess then and, and I know that we have recorded this. And so I'm assuming that this will be made available to all of you if you want to go back and catch parts of it that you want to sort of, you know, rewatch or have a chance to, you know, sort of um, dig into the next level of detail. So what I what I'm going to recommend is right. I'm not going to overwhelm you with a lot of readings and podcasts until we get through the course. Right. And by then, I think a lot of you will have a much better idea of where you would like to take this and what resources would be helpful to you. And then I can sort of, you know, share a whole wide range of content with you, either links or, you know, public domain content that I think will allow you to take your learning to the next level. Okay. I'm going to be attending a conference at Notre Dame in November, which is an invite only conference for about a hundred people on how AI is going to be deployed in education. And so would be happy to share that with all of the folks, you know, on this call as in the agenda is being developed as we speak. Okay. So I know obviously a lot of you from the educational world as well. Okay. So please come with any questions, come with any thoughts. Um, but it's, it's been a joy to have a chance to get to know you tonight. And, and I'm looking forward to, you know, working with you through this learning journey and, and helping you meet the goals that you've set out for yourself for being here, okay? All right, everyone, you have a great rest of the night and we'll see you in a week, okay? Thank you now. Bye-bye. Thanks, Mike.